And so we, uh, we're glad that you're part of our family. And I always look forward to your lessons, and I'm especially looking forward to today. And I'm so glad to see all the chairs filled. So with no further ado, Stuart Locke. Well, thank you very much for the chance to come and share this lecture with you today. So as you probably know, this is a lecture that I gave at Auburn a week and a half ago, I think something like that. that um, so before I give the lecture, let me just explain a little bit about what they asked me to do at Auburn, um, and what I'll do that's the same today, and what I'll do that's different. Um, so Auburn, this is called the, the final lecture. Um, Luckily, after I found out about it, it doesn't mean it's the, the final lecture you're ever going to be on. <laughs> <laughs> I thought there was going to be there be able to say, thank you for your time, please. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a, supposed to be a lecture that's near the final part of the semester. And the guidelines they gave me were that I had to give advice to the students, especially the first year students who are coming near the end of their first year, advice on how to survive at college. And, advice to the final year students who are going to move on in kind of life and bigger stuff beyond that. Um, the problem is that I make it a point in life to try and never give advice to anyone. That um, I hate getting advice, I always do the opposite of what people tell me to do. Uh, and also advice just doesn't fit everybody. A piece of advice for one person doesn't necessarily fit with someone else. Um, so I decided instead what I would do is just tell stories uh, and really tell a little bit about myself and how I came to America and what happened. And if the students took it as advice, that would be fine um, and it was designed that way. If not, they could just sit back and relax and enjoy the stories. So that's the same idea here. What I'd like to do, um, instead of... Um, I have basically three points I wanted to tell the students. And each of them, when I made them up, had a definite spiritual aspect to it, a kind of uh, spiritual application. But when I said it to the students, I just did it telling stories and left it up to them to make the connections. I thought for today, maybe I should make the connection more obvious since it's a Sunday school lesson. But every time I tried to do that, it just took away from the, the, the point of the lecture, which was just to share experiences and have the students make the connections themselves to the application. So I decided after a bunch of thinking and swapping things around, just to give the lecture exactly like it was, and then you can make the connections yourself to the kind of life advice, uh, or you can just sit back and relax. But again, I'll let you uh, kind of make that up yourself. Um, the, uh, the, the, just to kind of fill in with the background, this is something at Auburn where the students organise everything. They organise the vote, they organise it on the night. Um, so on the actual night, um, it starts at 8 o'clock, and by like 5 minutes to 8, 2 minutes to 8, there was me and Jessica, two people from Epiphany, <laughs> who organised it, who organised the vote, and um, Jessica's parents and a couple of other people. And then one minute to eight, all the students basically showed up. So, so you guys are way more organised. <laughs> um, so, and also, you know me a little bit better than the students at Auburn do. Um, so, but I decided. Um, just to give you the lecture as it is, uh, th that way also I don't have to point out the things that were the same, things that were different, constantly referring backwards and forwards. Okay, so let me just give you the lecture as it was. Um, so as I said, this lecture isn't really designed to be um, advice uh, as much as just designed to be me sharing some of my experiences. Um, and if you want to take advice from it, that would be good. If not, then just, just enjoy the stories. But one of the difficulties I have uh, that you've already experienced and that I have at Auburn is that um, my accent can be hard to follow and uh, I come from a, a small uh, town called Blantyre in Scotland which is an old mining town uh, though there's no mines there anymore they're all closed down and it's just beside a fairly big city called Glasgow and if you were to look at Scotland and pick the place that has the hardest accent to understand you would pick Glasgow every single time so actually I come from it's strange that I lecture as a living because I come from the the one part of Scotland where in Scotland nobody can understand us and moving outside of Scotland is even harder. <laughs> so, so what I'd like to do to begin with, and this actually might make sense of a lot of previous lessons that I've, give, I've given, you might finally understand what I was saying, is to give you a five minute tutorial on Scottish <laughs> and uh, tell you some of the sounds, especially Glaswegian or Glasgow sounds, because what happens is we change all of our vowels, um, so that makes it harder when we change about half of the consonants. Um, so, um, so there are three things I wanted to kind of tell you, uh, so that when I give the lecture, it actually makes sense. Uh, and I'll try, as I say, the lecture not to to go back to the way I would say, but often I forget. Mm -hmm. that, um, 
Okay, so um, one of the main things you'll recognise, and I'll try not to do this, but I might fall back into it, is um, the way we pronounce our T's in the middle. So um, we actually, Scottish by definition is kind of a lazy accent, so we tend to not use our tongue and our teeth if we don't have to. So we'll, uh, so we won't say butter, we say butter. And so we actually make it in our throat. It's called a glottal stop. So we don't say butter, we say butter. We don't say water, we say water. And especially, we don't say, whenever we say Scottish, we say Scottish. That, um, and then, um, so that you probably would figure out. Um, the other thing I have difficulty with here is we roll our R's in Scotland. Uh, and mine isn't particularly strong, but it can get strong if I, if I forget. That, um, so for some reason, for me, the number three is, it's okay when people are watching me because I can do that. <laughs> but if I'm on the phone and I say three, somehow it doesn't, it seems like it's, what other word could that sound like as we know it's a number? But if I'm given a telephone number over the phone, and all Auburn numbers start three, three, four. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll give my number and I'll say three, three, four, and the person will say, what was the first one? I said three. And I said, did you say four? And I said, I said three. And I said two. And I don't think I had to say two plus one. <laughs> the between two and four, that's the number I'm trying to say. And, uh, and, uh, so, uh, all my words, I kind of roll my R's, especially if I'm reading the Bible or praying, I kind of go back into, into that for some reason. And then the, the last thing I wanted to tell you was kind of a, to do an experiment with you. Um, to see if this sounds as strange as it sounds to people normally. So, if I give you guys a letter, can you tell me a word that starts with that letter? So, if I said the letter O, tell me a word. Orange. 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 Uh, I. I. A. Apple. Oh, and the, the New Zealand person got it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, for some reason, uh, in Scotland our A's and E's are almost identical. That uh, I don't see, I, I actually can't do it the way that you say it here. Yeah, like an A Y E, like long A. So I have the hardest time with my name, S T U A R T. Everyone spells, if I spell it out, it's S T U E R T, because uh, my A's and E's are almost the same. So my E's are okay, but my A's, everyone thinks I just said E again. So actually, what I say now is, my name is, is Stuart, S T U A for Apple, R T. And when people say, Apple starts with an A, not an E. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think it's best to be honest. Okay, so hopefully you can up to speed with my accent and, and the weird way I'm going to say stuff. Just as uh, just for my own benefit, um, I get commission from Scotland if I make people do this. Um, if you all could say the word Scottish properly with an N instead of a T. So, one, two, three. Scottish. Excellent. Very good. Okay, that's great. So, so now let me start the lecture properly. Uh, and as I said, I have three points that I wanted to make. And um, while these points were, are made with students in mind, I think they apply to everyone in general. They're just um, things I've experienced through life. They're not particularly just for college. So the first thing that I wanted to tell you was that, um, uh, about learning. And uh, in my experience of learning, so I study physics, I do research in physics, uh, and at high school I quite liked physics, it was okay, it wasn't my favourite, but it was alright. Um, but once I got to university, I just loved physics from the first minute that I saw it. I loved everything about it, it was kind of hard, but, but um, for me it was just discovering how the universe is made up, what are the laws that, that govern everything, what are the fundamental particles that make things up, what are the forces that make things up. So for me it was not just kind of something I had to do for the test, but something that I really enjoyed just discovering about it. And there were so many things that I learned that were the opposite of the way I would have guessed that they were. And, but this is something that's true not just for physics. I think every topic that you pick, um, whether it's an art subject, um, um, an, uh, English, philosophy, um, or reading the Bible, finding out about God, then all of these subjects are something if you dig in a little bit to them, and, and find out about the details. They're really exhilarating. Um, it's an exhilarating experience to kind of figure this stuff out. That because uh, what you're really doing is you're finding out how the universe works. In physics, you're finding out how these inan inanimate objects move. Um, in in uh, English and philosophy and history, you're finding out how society works and how people work and how and how uh, what are the laws in a sense that, that govern govern those kind of things. And um, probably already you've 
experienced some things in your life where you've really enjoyed learning something, where you've just, it's captured your imagination, that you've really been able to kind of um, experience this kind of rush as you're learning it. Not that it's not hard work, learning is always a bit hard work, you have to put the effort into it. But at some point, with the hard work, it becomes this kind of nice, smooth experience, almost like learning to ski or something like that. Hard work to begin with, you fall over a lot, but at some point you get this exhilaration of skiing. For me, that's what learning is like. You have this kind of buzz of actually learning this stuff. And it's not a buzz proving you're smart, it's a buzz kind of because you discover something about how the universe is. It's sort of, um, um, you have this connection to, that you figure something out. So what I wanted to do was to tell a story kind of illustrating that. And all the stories I know are from physics, you'll have to forgive in this next part. But um, I, I easily could have picked any other topic, I'm sure, if I had known those other topics. But physics is all I know, so that's what I'll tell you. Mm -hmm. And the idea here is to illustrate, all it takes is a kind of simple, careful thought process to figure out some really profound things that most principles at heart are very straightforward and simple. Once you put them into practice, then the results can seem really complicated. But if you can home in on what is the fundamental rules that, that make things happen, then, then you have a chance to kind of really understand something important about the universe. So if I could take you back in time a little bit to the 1800s, and there scientists had lots of questions, things they didn't know, but one of the big ones was what is the sun? What makes it? What is it made up of? Why is it on fire? Uh, what is burning? Um, how much energy does it use up? Uh, they just didn't know. That, um, but they were starting to have sort of a scientific method, been able to figure things out. So uh, there was a man called James Herschel in 1838 decided that he would try and figure this out for himself. And he had the simplest of ideas that really anybody could have thought of, but nobody had. And he took this one idea and he discovered something profound. So what he wanted to know was how much energy does it take to keep the sun going? So he thought, well, let's work out how much energy the sun gives off. Every second, that will let us know how much it needs to keep going. So, of course, we can't get to the sun, it's too far away, but then they couldn't get into space. Uh, so he thought what he would do, and I have to say his equipment was a little bit more complicated than this, but essentially what I'm about to tell you is what he did. He took essentially a bucket of water and a thermometer. So he had the thermometer outside, under a kind of a shade, in, in the water, and he measured the temperature of the water. He took the shade away, and then he, he counted how long did it take the sunlight, he picked a sunny day of course, to heat up the bucket of water by one degree Celsius. And he knew how much energy it takes to heat up water from inside his house by just heating up with a flame. He could measure that, how much stuff got burned. Um, so after that one simple experiment, just with a bucket of water and a thermometer, he knew how much the sun heats up this little area um, per minute, that kind of thing. So then he worked out how much it does per, per square yard. Um, then he knew the size of the surface of the earth, they knew the radius of the earth at that point. So he could work out how much energy from the sun hits the earth every second. And then he used his imagination and thought a little bit beyond that. And he knew how far away the sun was, so he imagined, well the sun probably gives off its energy equally in all directions, so you have a big sphere of energy that's constantly given off. And if he knew how far away the earth was from the sun, which he did at that point, he could work out the area of this big sphere. So not just a little bit that has the earth, but the whole big sphere. So just with a, some very simple math, he went from a bucket of water and a thermometer to how much energy the sun gives off every second. And the thing that was a big surprise to him was it gives off a lot more energy than anybody suspected. And in fact, when they looked up the strongest chemical reactions they knew at the time, the sun would only last about 3,000 years. It should have been out um, not that long ago. So then they tried to think of other ideas of what could happen. They thought maybe comets coming in and hitting the sun and heats it up and gives us extra energy and gives it extra fuel. And nothing they could think of would make the sun last for more than three or four thousand years really. And what he had stumbled upon was something really important, that there was an energy source in the sun that they did not know about in the 1800s. They didn't know what it was, but they knew that there was some other energy source there. And it took scientists a long time to figure it out, but a hundred years later, once we knew about nuclear reactions, we realised that the sun is powered by a nuclear reaction in its core. It takes hydrogen, which is mostly what it's made up of. It gravitationally compresses it down, fuses the hydrogen to give you helium. It's like a big nuclear bomb, if you like. And that all the energy that's given off is enough to power the sun. That's the only thing that was able to give off that amount of energy. And the amazing thing is that this one man with one bucket of water and one thermometer basically figured out 
that there has to be something of that kind of order of magnitude of energy. So it wasn't that he was an especial genius to figure this out, he just thought carefully about it and he figured out something about the universe that we didn't know about before. Of course he didn't figure out it was a nuclear reaction, that took a lot longer, but he was kind of the start of that whole process. So the important thing to me is that if you're learning anything, whether it's on your own as a hobby or as part of a course, is to dig a little bit deeper into the subject, to kind of ask questions about it, to not just believe the teacher because he, he says something is true, that, that it is true, but also to think how can you test it, how can you change it a little bit, how can you really be sure that what you're asking is right. And for that, you don't have to have lots of qualifications to do it, you just have to have a careful thought process in working it through. That, um, so for me, that process of learning is really kind of an, an exhilarating thing. Um, but of course, some subjects take a little bit more to delve into before you really start to appreciate them. So it's worth giving it a bit of effort and, and trying. But I think this is true for any subject that you pick, not just for, for physics. Um, and so it's really kind of a, a fulfilling experience for me, the process of learning. That, um, and it's something that isn't just for college, that it goes throughout your whole life. If you can have this enjoyment of always learning, I mean, it's your brain that you're kind of working with and, and keeping active and improving. That um, it's sort of a nice whole picture of life, nice fulfilling uh, experience. So that was the first thing I wanted to tell you was to, to pick something to learn and to really enjoy it, dig into it, and to kind of make the most of it. The second thing sort of falls on from that that one of the m most important things that you can learn um, you learn by by exposing yourself to new experiences. And of course, most of you know that already. And um, but one of the best ways to do that is to travel to other countries. And again. With this audience, most of you have, have done that more than I have uh, in many cases. But for me, I, I grew up in Scotland in this one small mining town um, and really didn't travel until uh, after university. I finished my undergraduate degree. I think I had been to Paris for a, for a weekend once and a school thing. And that was all I had ever really travelled. So I decided when I was about 21, I think, that I really should try and travel and see more of the world. And in Europe, this is sort of easy, or easier maybe than here, to travel and find a culture that's very different from where you are just now. So I decided I would buy a cheap student train ticket, which in Europe you can get, and it's valid on every train in every country, and you can buy it for two weeks or a month, I think I had two and a half weeks was what I got mine for. And then I decided just to take off and see some of Europe. So I went from Scotland to Paris, which wasn't so bad because they spoke English there still, and, and um, whenever... I <laughs> Whenever I tried to speak French, um, they would just immediately speak English. <laughs> so then, um, so then I, I went to Switzerland and saw a little bit of Switzerland. And there I was in some places where they mostly spoke French, only spoke a little bit of English. So after Paris, I was still trying to, I realised that I just was not speaking French very well. So I tried to speak English in those places, but because of my accent, they understood me better speaking French than they did speaking <laughs> English. That in fact, they actually tell me, stop speaking English, just speak French, so we understand your accent better there. That, um, so that was the first time where I really had to survive without speaking any English, where I had to just book trains and hotel rooms, order meals. I tried to do it as cheaply as possible, so I stayed with friends or families. And a lot of those places, um, those friends didn't speak any English at all. So that for me was really a kind of um, an eye-opening experience that had what I thought of as my whole universe was really just a small part of Scotland. And all of a sudden I saw these different cultures, different ways of thinking, um, different um, habits in life, even just simple things like the way French <coughs> people do dinners. I had never experienced this big two hour long kind of relaxed um, atmosphere. In Scotland we eat fast and then we're off to something else. Um, and just the little things like that to, that I had never thought to question before. And that was what travelling for me did. It made me question things that I had just taken for granted up to that point. Other, it kind of made me think that I have blind spots that I don't know about, that things that I had never thought of, that, that I never would have thought to question. And then it's so after Switzerland, I went down to Prague, stayed there, then came back to Paris, then went back to Scotland. So really all I saw was a relatively small part of it. Um, I wish I had taken more time to see that. But for me, there's really nothing that can, can give you that same life experience as just travelling, especially travelling to somewhere that's very different from your own culture, your own upbringing, not just language, but just kind of customs and ways of thinking that's really kind of a mind-broadening experience. So for me, then coming to America, of course it's much easier to transition from Scotland to America, but actually much harder than you would think. And so I decided early on, when I came over here, to treat it as an adventure, that to kind of enjoy it, not to get too stressed out by the things that went wrong. 
And it really was an adventure, it was an exciting time coming across. My first time really being so far away from home and um, in, in a different city, different, um, different town, I had a new job. Uh, all those things were kind of new, there was a lot to take in. I remember being kind of exhausted every night just from the effort of having to remember <laughs> not to say Scottish, but to say Scottish and things like that. Um, but there's a few things that happened early on that uh, at the time were, were kind of a little bit stressful, but actually were, looking back were, were some of the most enjoyable kind of things that happened. So let me tell you those just to kind of share them. So the, uh, when I finished grad school, I, I looked like most physicists do, so I had long hair, I was sort of unshaven and, and kind of unkempt in general. And um, so I, um, and I, that's, yeah, that's how you're supposed to look as a physicist. So, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so I, I, but after a month or so in Auburn, I said I better get a haircut. But I wanted to keep the same general dishevelled kind of uh, look. <laughs> so I went into the barber on uh, Magnolia Street in, in uh, Auburn, and then I, and I guess my accent was much stronger then. Though it seems to me like it's not changed that much. But I said. Um, Excuse me, I'd like a trim, please, just a wee bit half. And, uh, and then he had no idea what I just said. <laughs> and uh, I realised that, and then he said something, and I had no idea what he said. And I said, I'd like a trim, please, just a wee bit half, just that much. And then he went, oh. And then I sat down, he got the clippers out, and went, <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was asking what to say, but I left on. And then so I had this sort of inverse what you can do. <laughs> and realised that at that point it's too late to change it. I may as well do this black, get the shortest haircut I've ever had. And, um, and then so as I was sitting there thinking, this was harder than I thought. This should be kind of easy. We're both speaking English. It shouldn't be that hard. I realised that, and just to fill you in, in Scotland, if people tell jokes about Scottish people, what they always make fun of is that we never spend money unless we have to, that we're, we're really, um, that whenever possible we save money and we don't ever spend it. So as I'm sitting there with the shortest haircut I've ever got, I'm thinking, I'm not going to need to get my hair cut for a long, long time. <laughs> <laughs> and that, I basically do it all back out again in a year and a half and never had another haircut until after that. And by that point, I guess my accent wasn't quite so hard and they could understand me. But then just after that, so I had this super short haircut. I went uh, a few weeks later to get my driving test because you guys quite wisely don't trust us to drive here because we drive on the wrong side over there so you have to prove that we can know what we're doing. So I sat the theory test, that was okay, and I was about to sit the practical test and at that point in uh, Auburn you could, the international folks could sit their test in, in Opelika, now you have to go to Montgomery to do it. Anyway, so I was in the test centre, all ready to go and the lady was just taking my details. So hair colour, height, eye colour. <coughs> at this point I had realised there was a lot more things that did not make any sense the way I would say them and I, had, I thought I had figured most of them out. And um, So I got to weight and most of Europe worked in kilograms but I knew you guys worked in pounds. But in Scotland we work in pounds as well. But we have another unit um, called the stones. Yeah, And actually I've forgotten the conversion but I think it's 16 pounds in a stone. Sorry. Something like that. It's long since I used it. And then so I just assumed because we use pounds and stones, you guys use pounds and stones. So the lady said, um, what's your weight? And I said, 11 and a half stones. And then she started laughing. And then she said, could you mind going out, finding one of these stones, <laughs> and we'll see how much you are in pounds. And then at that point I realised that you guys can't use stones after all, that you just use pounds. So I'm trying to multiply by 16 in my head to work out what I really am. And at that point, she's still laughing, and she stopped the whole test centre in Opelika, and she called all the instructors and said, please say exactly the same answer again. And they all started laughing. And, uh, so they really do have a sense of humour with the DMV, it doesn't look like it. Really kind of so, but both those things I decided early on just to enjoy them, to kind of treat that as part of the adventure. If everything was the same as Scotland, it wouldn't be quite so much fun. Part of the fun of coming here was to have those kind of adventures. And really that's sort of a minor thing, <coughs> just two cultures that are already kind of similar. So you can imagine how different it is going to somewhere completely different and living there for a while and kind of the eye-opening things that you get. And one of the good things at Auburn that you also have here um, is that you have people from lots of different nationalities, especially it seems to me like America has that more than, than Scotland has. So you get the chance to experience other cultures without having to travel in some ways. Of course you can't really replicate the experience of traveling. So, uh, most of you already do this, but I encourage you to kind of get to know people from other cultures, find out their way of thinking, the things that are similar, things that are different, and to enjoy it as part of the adventure of life. That, that, um, and then the last point I wanted to make 
was actually not something so much that I've learned um, uh, through my own experiences, but was something that my parents taught me. And it's really a phrase that they taught me um, that you can think of it as a phrase that's useful to say under a whole bunch of different circumstances. Uh, whether things are going well or things are going badly or you're just trying to stressed out, trying to think of what to do. And the phrase that they would say is that it's not all about you, Stuart. That, um, <coughs> that, uh, so basically, the other way they would say it is to take your eyes off yourself, look around about you, and try and look at the other people that are there. That, um, that especially when things are stressful, it's easy to kind of become insular, to kind of become closed, not ask for help, to kind of um, uh, not really be aware of people around about you. It's such a, it's one of the hardest things to do, and I can't say I'm all that good at it, uh, but to be able to take your eyes off yourself, look at others, realise the worries, the stress that they have. It, for a start, it just takes the pressure off yourself. Mm -hmm. If everything's about yourself, then you're thinking about yourself all the time. If you're thinking about others, then the pressure's not so much on you. It's not up to you to fix everything. It makes it easier to ask for help. It also makes it possible to, um, to help other people, that you suddenly realise the problems other people have. Um, that if you think of life as sort of an adventure, really it's an adventure that's best shared with other people. It's not really an, an adventure just by yourself quite so much. So the, the, this, at this point I'd like to encourage you to kind of, um, under a whole host of circumstances, remember take your eyes off yourself, look around, look at others, and share the adventure with them. That, um, and for me, I've experienced this mostly through other people doing it for me, and my parents, obviously. Um, that I have to say, teaching is, is a good example of this. If the lecture is about the professor, it's really not a very good lecture and the students don't learn very much. If the focus is on the students and helping them figure stuff out, that has a chance of being a good lecture at that point. Um, but for me, mostly what I've experienced is other people doing this for me. The times where I was stressed <coughs> out, someone else looked out and kind of helped me. And in Auburn, when I first got there, my, my first weekend, uh, I went to local church, I put my name in the visitor's sheet, and then just went finished the service and people talked to me, it was nice, and went back to my work on the Monday. But it turns out there was a retired physics professor who's on one of the committees that churches have um, to, to welcome new visitors. And then so he was a physics person, he knew I was physics. Turns out he hired my, old, my boss at the time, so he, he knew my boss. So I was sitting in my office doing some research on the Monday. He came by and said, introduced himself, his name was Bill Alford. Uh, he'd been retired at that point for probably 15 years, I think, but he said, I realize you're new to this country, you, there's no pressure to come back to our church, but if you would like to just have any questions. And at that point, I'd had a whole bunch of experiences, like the ones I've just described to you, and I said, well, I actually have tons of questions, none of these things make any sense to me. How does this work? How does this work? And, um, and then so he was really nice to me. He took me in to his house, him and his wife gave me dinner that week. They introduced me to people that they knew in Auburn. It really, for me, made the transition to Auburn much easier to have these people who had looked out for me. And they both had busy lives, and they have a huge family, about three million grandchildren, I think, at this point. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and really, they, they, um, they took time out of their busy schedules to look out for me, and they did it consistently over that whole time. And I never thought about it in this context, but really what they did was take their eyes off themselves. They were looking out for me. And Jessica and I have found exactly the same thing here um, that you guys just do naturally. So. Um, from the first Sunday we visited the Sunday school class here, uh, everyone was so welcoming and Andy took us up to the main hall and sat beside us so we knew where to go. Because it's not that easy actually to find your way up from down here, that uh, is a bit of a thought. And um, everyone's been so welcoming and, and we have some really good friends that really... And what it did for us is it transformed living in LaGrange, which is where both of us had our first permanent jobs, of course not in LaGrange. Um, for the first few years we just lived here, slept here and worked in somewhere else and then came back here. Um, once we got to know people here, it really felt like we had a life here and that we actually had, had uh, we were living rather than just working. That is, so for us it was really, um, it made life a lot easier, uh, a lot more fun. It really was, it became an adventure, uh, more of an adventure at that point to have friends to kind of share things with. So we very much enjoyed being part of this class and part of this church. Um, so I would encourage you to do the same, I think you're already doing this, there's already a close group of people here, but to share your life with other people and look out for other people who need help, who maybe are, are not able to ask for help um, and, uh, and kind of make that part of the adventure. So just to kind of summarise, really what I'd like to tell you is that life is an adventure, um, but of course the reality is it's a dangerous adventure, that it can be a heartbreaking adventure, it can be uh, risky, it can be difficult, it can take courage, uh, there are times where you just don't want to do it, um, 
it's not like it's an adventure in the sense that it's an easy, fun adventure where everything always works out. There can be tragedies and, and heartbreaks, as we can see from the news. Um, but that's not a reason not to take part in the adventure. It's going to happen anyway. Uh, life goes on. That, that, uh, you have to take part in it. So the three things that I've experienced in my life that can help to kind of make the adventure fun for me is to really enjoy the process of learning, to dig into topics, to kind of uh, enjoy them and share them with others, and um, to travel and experience other cultures more than just your own. You have a much wider experience of adventure at that point. Um, and this last one, to share the adventure with others, take your eyes off yourself, um, to, to enjoy talking to others and to, and to share it with it. That it means that the adventure is a much more kind of fun, uh, exhilarating, fulfilling experience that you can have. So that's all I wanted to tell you. That concludes the lecture. Um, we have a couple of minutes left uh, if you want to uh, finish. But if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer questions, or we can just wrap up there and then finish. So thank you. Oh yeah, and then the first time I taught, um, that I, I was doing rotational motion, so I had a um, I had a, a ballerina doing a pirouette and bring your arms in, and you can move faster out and you go slower. So, I, but we just say ballet dancer in Scotland. Mm -hmm. Everybody thought I said belly dancer. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so I had this class of 150 people at that point. My first class I had taught, and. I'm saying, so imagine this ballet dancer spinning around, bringing her arms in and out. And I can see the class go. <laughs> they're, they're trying to picture this belly dancer doing it. And then all of a sudden, one of the guys said, oh, he's saying ballet dancer. <laughs> and in my class, that's one of the fun things. I was actually figuring out the things that, because I can tell from their expressions right away that I've said something that doesn't make any sense here. <laughs> then I have to work out what sense it was that didn't make sense and kind of figure it out. And it makes it more than just mundane. And I had the same thing. Um, I was at gosh, this was 2000, I think, at Westside, and the spelling word was Parker, right? As in jacket, right? Every child spelled P A R K E R. Some of them you have to say, yeah. you know, as an example of what it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I can see there's a risk in your job that you could teach them this word that they misunderstand and then goes on through their whole life. <laughs> 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 I have another one which is the, the lady at school who people at school make fun of me. And it's, it's, you know, you go down here if you want to kind of sell something. Sell something. Second hand, what's it called? Mm. The pawn shop. Yeah. yeah. Ah. <laughs> 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 researcher just in one one room by myself. I never really got to see that many other people. Mm -hmm. So whenever I had to interact with the secretaries or the faculty, they had a real hard time understanding me. There was tons of stuff that happened like that. Does Jessica interpret for you in a drive-thru? <laughs> yeah, That's actually, sometimes. Did you get something with branch? Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't do drive-thru anymore. Uh, like, yeah. Just, uh, just, just, just be quiet. Okay, yeah. we want number three. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. we'll stop, swap <laughs> seats. <laughs> <laughs> But actually, the first time I met Jessica's parents, I, I saw her grandparents first, and her granddad has a small plot of land where he keeps some cows and, and, uh, and farms a little bit, and has a really strong accent, and is one of the most amazing people I've met. And then I went to her parents' house, and it's the first time I'd ever met them, so I was trying to kind of make conversation, and I said, I saw Jessica's <coughs> granddad earlier, and I saw his cows, and they said, his what? <laughs> and I said, his cows? <laughs> and then, they clearly did not know what I just said, and I couldn't think of another word for cows. <laughs> I, I, I think I should have thought cattle or something like that, but I just said 
cows, you know, cows, cows. <laughs> and, then, and then Jessica came in just at the right point to translate because I was just going. <laughs> 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 So it's one of the fun things. That we say our, our kids are going to speak scuther. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you seen 39 steps where they have that scene? The, yeah. the old one? The, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And actually, I read that book recently, and it's amazing how accurate he gets the kind of Scottish accent. <laughs> <laughs> the film did the same thing. <clears throat> that, uh, in Britain, they really make fun of people from Glasgow having such a hard accent. I understand. I have lots of little traps I could show you guys. You know, that, that's where the southern accent really came from. So many Scottish yeah. people yeah. Uh, settled yeah. in the south, and how we elongate our vowels yeah. and probably you know, yeah. came. Yeah. From yes, it that. should be easy. It really should be, and I can see so many similarities between stuff that we were seeing. It's the same principles. It's just went off. Well, when uh, the last time Stuart's like 86 year old grandmother came to visit over here, oh, yeah. I took her to Callaway Gardens, and along the way she was saying she wants to just spend a penny. And of course, because she's Scottish, I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, you're you're cheap. But <laughs> <laughs> what I actually, I was saying, no, you can spend more than that. I didn't realize she was saying she needs to go to the bathroom, so she kept saying it, it costs a penny. It costs a penny. <laughs> they say I want to spend a penny, they need to go to the toilet. <laughs> so I was like, you can spend more than that. <laughs> well, thanks for your attention. Thank you. Tell these boys and girls that you know the big